Good evening and welcome to the Spirit and Life Bible Study. My name is Jonathan. Our reader is Cara tonight and our topic is to raise the dead. This has nothing to do with volume level. This is about another one of the purposes of why Jesus came into this world. We've been doing a whole series of these and one of the types of miracles that he did again and again was to raise the dead. And part of what I'm interested in tonight is why this word raise. I mean, there, there are sort of obvious reasons you can see behind it, but the verbs in this whole series have been interesting to me. And why is it that you cleanse the lepers, but you heal the sick? And why is it that you raise the dead? Uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at. And I invite you to join us on that journey. Can we open with a prayer, good friends? I think we're going to be able to reach tonight. Yeah. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for bowing the heavens and coming down into the world and then being raised up again after your physical body died. Please tell us, Lord, what it is that you wish to do for us when you raise us up from the dead. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Uh, sending love out to those of you online and those getting the audio and so on. Uh, those on the phone, delighted to be with you again and talking about this series to raise the dead. And I'd like to start where we've started some other weeks. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11, shall we? And uh, read one of these lists again, just as a starting point. So Matthew 11, uh, verse two. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Mm. Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Yes, that's right. So this is really his testimony. This is one of those sort of anchor passages on which I'm basing this series that the, the dead are raised up. Uh, this is one of the things that shows that he's the Messiah. And you've got to admit, friends, uh, uh, you know, maybe we can figure out how to cure someone's headache or stomach ache or something like that, or maybe our medicine can do this or that or the other thing. But raising the dead, that's got to be the ultimate, right? Raising the dead has to be the ultimate miracle. It, it's the it's ordinarily that sort of gateway that people go through and, and you don't come back. And, uh, and yet the Lord was able to raise the dead. He said that as part of his evidence that he was the Messiah, that he was raising the dead. And let's read a couple of stories along those lines. There's actually one just a couple of chapters before this in Matthew chapter 9. Uh, look, let's start at verse 18 there. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Now that's really remarkable that he, he thought that Jesus would have that power, you know? It's amazing that he thought if Jesus just laid his hands on this daughter, she would come back to life, even though she's dead. And verse 19. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Yes, and then there's this uh, inset story that happens for the next three verses, and let's go down to verse 23. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. I don't know if you're aware of this idea, but back then, uh, in order to you know, properly celebrate those who had passed on, you'd have paid mourners. You'd have people who would come over and weep and make, make noise and so on. This was part of the ritual. And so it's very odd, isn't it, in this story, the way their mood changes so rapidly um, that they're, they're weeping and making noise one moment. And then he said, uh, you know, she's asleep. And they just instantly laugh him to scorn. You know, they, 
they, they, immediately they, they turn. So it kind of suggests that this grief was not so, I don't know, you can see why they would laugh. I mean, it, it's as if he's made a mistake. He says, she's not dead, she's sleeping. Uh, he, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. He seems like an idiot. Go on. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. Mm. Just like, just as the, uh, the ruler believed. If he just extends his hand to her, she'll come back. And it happened exactly that way. She got up, and in verse 26. And the report of this went out into all the land. Yes, you can imagine. Uh, this, is, this is really, really striking. I mean, so is healing the blind, so is healing the deaf and all these other things, cleansing leprosy. Uh, but this is remarkable that he had that power and seemingly effortlessly just stretches out his hand and brings her back. And what does he mean that she's not dead? She's sleeping, that they found su such a ridiculous thing to say at that moment. Um, look at John chapter 11 is another classic one to the right, a few gospels there. This is quite a lengthy story. We might skip around a little bit in here in the interest of time, but let's start at the first verse there of chapter 11, because the whole story, John is such a very focused kind of discourse. And uh, this is a particular discourse about death and resurrection. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was, that Mar it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Mm. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Yes, this is an important detail that the Lord loved Lazarus. And uh, Swedenborg says that Lazarus represents people outside the religious tradition of that time. Uh, the, the so-called Gentiles, uh, and he loved, it's a picture of his love for the Gentiles. Uh, go on. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. It's a little bit like saying she's not dead, she's sleeping. He says this sickness is not unto death. Hmm. Um, yes, go on. Now Jesus loved Martha and, his, and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now that's just an odd sentence, isn't it? <laughs> he loved them. When he heard they were sick, he stayed right where he was and did nothing. <laughs> it's, it's an odd, you know, what is the logic of that? And then after two days, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. Aha, uh -huh. now there had been a plot, very clearly in the Gospel of John, there was a plot to kill him already. Go on. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Yes, and then he gives an answer. Let's skip down to verse 11. These things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. There it is again. He says he's sleeping. Hmm. Uh -huh. but, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Yes, we feel sorry for these poor benighted souls of the past who would take Jesus's words literally. It, who could ever do that? Of course he was talking about something deeper than that. All right. And then what does he say? Um, then Verse Jesus 14. said to them plainly, oh. Lazarus is dead. Oh, that's unusual. Wow, he shifted into plain speech instead of speaking kind of metaphorically or something. He said, Lazarus is dead. And then what? And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Yes. Okay. And so this was going to be a dangerous dangerous journey that he's got to do. And so he goes, uh, let's look at verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. And we just heard in verse 19 that there were a bunch of people there to comfort the two of them. 
Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mm. But amazing, even amazing statement, huh? Mm. Go on. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Will what again? Rise. Will rise. So raising. The, why, why is it about coming back from the dead is like going up? You know, you'll, he will rise be raised up, raising the dead. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Isn't that interesting that even back then in that religious tradition, there was this thought there would be this eventual moment at the end of time when people would, would rise up in some sense, whatever that meant to them. And so he says, your brother will rise again. She, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I know that, you know, I, I know that she's not taking a huge amount of comfort from that because that's going to be some eventual day. Uh, and then what does he say? A very important statement for our meeting this evening. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Mm. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who has come into the world. Mm. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. All right. And then we see his interaction with Mary. Um, let's start at verse 32 there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Exactly the same thing her sister said earlier. That's right. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now, in that other story, he just kind of reached out his hand, dealt with it. He said, she's just sleeping, but he's, he's disturbed, it seems, you know. He groans in his spirit and he's troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. The shortest uh, verse in the New Testament, Jesus wept. Yes, yeah, so he was, he was really troubled. And then he sees him and he's just, it seems that he's overcome. Then the Jews, the Jews said, see how he loved him. Mm. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Yes. Isn't it interesting that people thought that if you could do something as spectacular as healing the blind, you know, restoring their sight, why not do death? You know, why not do the whole thing? He could probably do that. Shouldn't he be able to do that? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Oh, interesting. A cave with a stone against it. Okay. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Mm. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Four, now, four days. This is not recently dead. This is four days dead. That, that's, hmm. Okay, go on. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Now, wait, nothing's happened yet, has it? But he's already in the past tense thanking the Lord for what hasn't happened yet. Very interesting. There's sort of a theme there's a number of times, like you think of Jonah in the belly of the whale, he thanks the Lord for being redeemed. Then the great fish vomits him out onto the dry land. You know, there, there's a number of times there's this theme, Daniel, when he goes to pray, when the whole government is arrayed against him, he thanks the Lord. You know, then, so it's just an interesting theme of thanking first. He thanks Father, you know, Father, he, he thanks the Father first. Um, Verse 42. And I know that you always hear me, 
says Jesus to the Father. That's right. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. It just strikes me that when he himself was on the cross, he cried out with a loud voice, didn't he? Mm. And there's so many things, the tomb and the stone, you know, there's sort of a layering thing here where Lazarus is sort of, going through the situation that Jesus will soon go through himself. But now Jesus is playing the role of, of the Father, so to speak, the divine love. So he cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the other time it was with his hand. Touched him with his hand. This time it's just a direct command. It's, it's kind of an amazing thing, isn't it? So what does Lazarus do? And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes mm, they would wrap your body all up with the spices and the burial you know the embalming fluid and everything so he's all wrapped up and he comes out just you've seen this image haven't you friends of uh lazarus just still wearing all the the grave clothes yep and his face was wrapped with the cloth mm. jesus said to them loose him and let him go mm. then and and uh so this deepens the plot to kill Jesus. And just as an interesting little side note, in chapter 12, verse 9, what happens there? Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Yes, Lazarus became something of a celebrity or whatever you call it, you know, uh, uh, they, they wanted to not only see Jesus, but they wanted to see Lazarus. Uh, they were amazed about it. So what do the chief priests think of? Um, sorry, I lost Verse 10. myself again. Thank you. That's all right. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death. Oh, that'll work. <laughs> because it's just amazing, isn't it? I mean, when somebody has brought somebody back to life, how effective is it to plot to sort of re-kill them? You know, is that... There's something amazing about the logic there. Go on. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Yes, they were losing people to this Lazarus mm -hmm. incident. Mm -hmm. And it, so it was, there. Were, Jesus already risked his life by going back to Judea. And it's very powerful to me that he went there in order to save Lazarus. You know, that's that was his mission, was to save Lazarus who means the, all these people who don't know the Lord kind of thing, but he loves them. And look at uh, verses 17 to 19. Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. Yes, this, this just the impact was huge that, that this thing had been done. And then I like this verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the, the world has gone after him. Yes, you are accomplishing nothing. You know, we're having no effect. And the only sort of impotent thing they can think of is trying to sort of re-kill Lazarus as if that's going to do anything to, to stop this hemorrhaging in the church that's going on, you know, that they're losing people to this issue of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Okay, there are a couple of miracles there, and I just want to turn back to the left to Luke chapter 15, if you will, because you, if you were with us last week, you may remember we were talking about the prodigal son, and uh, in 15 verse 24, how did the father of the prodigal son describe that situation? For this, my son was dead and is alive again. Oh, well, wait a minute. He wasn't physically dead. He had spent all the father's money. He was living out with the pigs and all that kind of stuff. But, but he wasn't physically dead. It's interesting that he referred to him as being dead and he is alive again. And then what came with last time, he was lost and is found. Interesting that it referred to it as... The father referred to him as having been dead. It kind of suggests that there are different kinds of death, doesn't it? Like 
in our physical world, death in one way seems like it's just one size fits all. You know, dead is dead. It's not like Princess Bride where you get mostly dead or something, you know, it doesn't really work that way. You're, 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 you're either physically alive or not. Um, but there is a different kind of, you know, the son was perfectly physically fine. He's a little hungry, whatever he was thinking, he was feeling things, he was doing work. How could you call that dead? And yet the father says he was dead, he's alive again because he's come back, because he's doing this repentance and so on. There's something, there's a deeper layer to this business of what death is exactly. I want to look now in the Old Testament. So turn back to your Old Testament and about a quarter of the way in, you'll find the two books of Kings. I want to go to 1 Kings chapter 17, if we may, uh, because there are Old Testament miracles. So Jesus performs this miracle uh, a number of times of raising the dead. And we see those two specific stories, one done with the hand, the other one by speaking. Now we go to the Old Testament. Here's 1 Kings chapter 17. And let's start at verse 17. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. No breath left. It doesn't say that he died, but there was no breath left in him. I mean, he must have been very close to, to death, I think. Go on. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Elijah was a prophet, and he had pro you know, told her that she was going to have this son and everything, and uh, was taking care of them, and, and so she's upset with Elijah now. Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? Mm. And he said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. His own bed. Elijah took him upstairs. Often houses back then would have a, a, a room on the wall, an extra room, you know, a guest room. And so he takes him upstairs to his own bed. Uh, and lays him on the bed. That's right. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And what did he do? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Yes. Doesn't it seem... Okay, so there's no breath in him. And then he prays, let his soul come back to him. That's, that's his prayer. Okay, and what happened? Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. Mm, so his soul came back, and he revived. Go on. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. He lives. That's right. So whether he was technically dead or just close to it, there's certainly the whole expression of that he had no breath, that his soul was gone. You know, it seemed like he had died. And then when Elijah brought him back, he said, See, your son is alive. And then listen to what the woman says to him. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. The word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Why would that say that the word of the Lord in his mouth was the truth? He did this miracle, and yet now, and didn't it seem like the same thing was happening in the New Testament, that when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, all of a sudden they believed him in a new way. They were, they were getting on board and believing him in a new way. Now I believe that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. He was definitely uh, seen as a prophet by this woman in a new way because he had brought her son back to life. Uh, so doesn't that associate the idea of the word and the truth with that bringing to life? Isn't there kind of a layering there? Um, and it talked about him having no breath. That has to do with truth. The fact that it's a son has to do with truth. And now the son is brought back to life. And he says, now I, she says, now I see the word of the Lord 
in your mouth is the truth. I think it's a little clue. And turn to the right to 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, there's a, a similar sort of story. We'll have to cut some of this down. Let's see. Uh, there's a woman in Shunem and Elisha now. Elijah was a great prophet. Elisha was his successor and asked for a double dose of his power when Elijah uh, was carried up in the chariots of fire and so on. And uh, so Elisha has just told this woman that she's going to have a child. Uh, she had not had a child. Her husband was old and she didn't hardly believe it, but she did have a child. And then verse 18 in 2 Kings 4. And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. I just find that one of the saddest things in scripture. My head, my head. <laughs> Go on. So he said to a servant, carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. Yes, so he died. Was it a heat stroke or something like that from being out in the fields? He just says, my head, my head. Hmm. Dies on his mother's knees. So what did she do? Then she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him, and went out. Now here's the same deal. Elisha is visiting her. He's staying in this upper room. She takes him up on that bed in the upper room. It's the same kind of story again. And now she heads out to find the man of God. Now along the way, her husband says, are you okay? She says, I'm fine. Everything's great. And she goes, and then, you know, it happens several times. She has to keep saying, everything's great. Just want to talk to the man of God. Uh, but then when she comes to him, you know, she says uh, what had happened. And look at verse 32. When Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Mm. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. Mm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house, and again went up and stretched himself out on him. Can you see it? Don't you find that when you're in the midst of a healing, friends, and it's not gone all the way yet, that you take a little break and you pace up and down like, what am I missing? What am I doing wrong? It's not happening. This has got to happen. You know, so he's pacing up and down and he goes back and he stretches out again. And then finally, then the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes hmm. and he called Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite woman. So he called her and when she came into him, he said, Pick up your son. Pick up your son. This raising, so often that sense of lifting or raising with these, with these cures from the dead. And I'm very impressed with her reaction here. So she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground, and she picked up her son and went out. She takes the time to bow down to thank him. She doesn't just grab the kid and run or something. You know, she, she, she bows down to thank him, and then she takes up her son, and she goes out. So those are a couple of uh, uh, those kind of healing miracles. And look at chapter 13 in this same Second Kings here. And uh, there's this odd little story that even after Elisha died, look in verse 20, Elisha died. Then Elisha died and they buried him. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. So it was, as they were burying a man, that suddenly they spied a band of raiders, and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he received, oh, sorry, he revived and stood on his feet. Wow. Well, that's a good trick. If it's a good trick to bring someone back to life when you're alive, <laughs> it's an even better trick to do it when you're dead. Uh, Elisha's bones were able to revive this person who was being buried uh, and, and he stood up on his feet. Another Old Testament miracle about being brought back to life. 
Okay, let's go to the New Testament again. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. We read this every week these days. Uh, look at chapter 10, verse 1 there. This is Jesus, and he calls together these 12 <coughs> disciples. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease. That's right. And then start in verse 6. What are they supposed to do? But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So the raising of the dead, the raising of the dead is something that Elijah participated in, Elisha participated in, Elisha's bones participated in. And when Jesus sent out the 12, he directly told them to raise the dead, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise. So he was giving them instructions that they were to participate as well in this raising from the dead. And along those lines, turn to the right just after the Gospel of John, get to the Acts there, and let's look at Acts chapter 9. Let's look at verse 36 there. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, mm -hmm. which is translated Dorcas. Yes. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Uh -huh. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. She died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Well, I'll be. They laid her in an upper room. The same thing we saw in those other stories. What is the upper room all about? They, they, she's died, and they take her into an upper room. Go, go on. And since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, uh -huh. they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Now, it's such an interesting, poignant little detail, isn't it? Isn't that kind of what you do when somebody dies? You just say, oh, here's the painting that they did, and I remember that time that we went up to the mountains, and, you know, you sort of go over the, the memories. So they're, they're weeping. This seems like a more genuine kind of grief. They're weeping, and they're showing these beautiful things that she had created. But what did Peter do? But Peter put them all out. Wow, that's what Jesus did too. He sent, sent all the mourners out of the room. That's so curious. Go on. And knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. Wow, that's a Lazarus-style raising of the dead, isn't it? Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. There you go. And what was the result? And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. Yes. Again, belief seems to be something that happens as a result of these miracles. And uh, look at chapter 20 in Acts for one more such story. So that was a Peter raising someone from the dead. And it's just sort of a nice blend of, you know, some are male, some are female, whatever, right? It's some old, some young. And uh, here's uh, Acts chapter 20. Let's go to verse uh, 7. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were now many... That's Sorry. That's pretty, we, we quit early around here, but Paul <laughs> kept going till midnight. That's right. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. Oh, they're in an upper room. Okay. 
And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus. Eutychus, that's right. Who was sinking into a deep sleep. I never had that happen when I'm preaching. Paul <laughs> must not have been very interesting. <laughs> Go on. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Oh, Yikes. I'm happy to say that, as far as I know, hasn't happened to me when, <laughs> when I was trying to bring a message. But poor Eutychus, he's just trying to hang in there, can't do it. Ever felt that way, friends? He falls <laughs> out of the window three stories and he's dead. Mm. Mm. But Paul, so this was a real upper room, you know. Shall I go on? Yes, please. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Isn't that interesting? It's a little bit like Jesus saying he's, they're sleeping, you know, they're not, they're not dead and that kind of thing. His life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Yes, it's a little <laughs> unclear to me exactly what happened in there or who did what to whom. But somehow Eutychus comes back to life. Uh, Paul was able to see that there was still life there or whatever. And that when morning came, uh, they, he, there he was alive, and they were comforted by that situation, understandably so. All right. Uh, uh, now, I want to turn to a strange scripture, a strange place for a talk about uh, raised from the dead. Let's go back to the creation story in Genesis. Because a certain thing I want to look at here. Now, we don't have time tonight to read this whole thing or we'd why we'd be here till midnight. Uh, but think about these days of creation. That's right. We're not on the third floor. We're, we should be pretty safe. Uh, now, uh, what, how might one summarize what happened on the first day of creation? Let, let's look at what the earth was like to begin with. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay, so the earth was without form and void. So you had an initial situation, and let's just call this void. I've drawn a box on the, on the chart uh, on the lower left that just says void. That's where we start out. The earth was without form and void. It's dark and so on. And then the first day is the arrival of light. Am I right? That's what the first day is all about. And isn't there a, a division of the light and the darkness? Right? So there's, there's light. So I'll do a second box that's up and to the right a little bit from that first box, which is, and I'll put a number one underneath there, and that's light I'll put a dotted line in between there and then say dark underneath it. So light and dark, boom. That's what comes about on the first day and there's this division. And then on the second day, what would you say goes on? I'll draw a box that's up a little bit and to the right from there and say water above and then a dotted line and then water below. Isn't that what, how you'd summarize that? You get waters and you get the waters that are above the firmament and the waters that are below the firmament. And the top part is called heaven and the bottom part. And the evening and the morning was the second day, so I'll put a two underneath there. Okay. And then we get to the third day, which is a little more complicated. Second day ends at verse 8 there in Genesis chapter 1. And then in verse 9, the water gets separating the dry land appears. That's the first thing that happens, right? So let's put a, another box up to the, uh, and to the right a little bit, and we have dry land. So it's dry versus wet kind of thing, right? You have the dry land separated from where the water is, and then you have plants in verse 11, right? Mm -hmm. So you have plants that come up on that dry land, 
and that is the third day. Okay, so uh, if you're not getting, the, if you're not seeing the video here, it's just like a series of steps, sort of half steps up from each other, without form and void, and then there's light and dark, then there's water and water, and then there's plants and the dry as opposed to the wet. Now we get to number four, right? That begins at verse 14 there, and I'm going to put box number four right on top of box number one. Box number one was about light and dark. Box number four, I'll put a four above it, is about the sun and the moon, right? And it says specifically that the sun is to rule by day and the moon is to rule by night, is it not? So you've got a reference back to the light and the dark, only this time now you've got the sun and the moon in number four. And then what happens in number five, begins at verse 20, you have the birds and fish, right? Oh, well, so in number two, you had water and water. So on top of two, I'm going to build a box going up, call it number five, and you have birds up above and a dotted line, and you have fish. So you have, they have birds in the air and fish in the water. That sort of goes with number two, doesn't it? So two and five kind of go together. And then in number six, verse 24, verse 24 thank you. You get first the animals and you get various creeping things. So I'm going to put a box six and put it on top of box three. And you get animals and various other sort of creatures. Oh, and that's interesting because you had dry land, you had plants on the dry land. Now you've got animals on the dry land and you have humans finally who come about and I'll put a six above that. So you get sort of zero and then you step up a bit number one, number one and then number two and then number three, but then you lap around to four, five and six as you, as you step up and you rise up toward humans. Now what I'm trying to drive at by talking about this tonight is that this to my mind, is more and more life. There's something more, you start out without form and void, then there's more when you have light and dark, that's a big, that's a big enhancement. Then you get the water. Now in day three, you've got actual living things coming out of the ground, which you couldn't have done if you didn't have light, you couldn't have done if you didn't have the waters above and below and the dry land and so on. Then you've got something added to just light. You have the sun and the moon so that the light and the darkness are both ruled by something from within. Don't you have something more alive when you have birds and fish than when you don't? If you just have water and water, well, that's neat, but it's not alive. The birds and the fish are more alive. So, so five is more alive than anything that went before. And then six, you get animals and you get humans and arguably, isn't that more alive? I know it's controversial. Some people think, well, we are animals and so on. But the idea is that there's more and more life going on here and it ascends. Mm. Well, if you started out without form and void, haven't you been raised? Wouldn't you call that raising? Isn't that mm -hmm. going up into more life and more life? And look, friends, uh, look in the middle of your Bible, you'll find the Psalms and then to the right is Isaiah and then go to Jeremiah chapter 4, Jeremiah is just to the right of Isaiah and in chapter 4 we read this amazing verse to me, verse 22 and 23. For my people are foolish, they have not known me, they are silly children. And they have no understanding. No understanding. They're foolish. My people, the Lord is saying, my children, right? They're foolish. They have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. Yeah, this phrase is in my head a lot for some reason. Doesn't it kind of characterize a certain kind of human state? Wise to do evil. Yeah, we're, real, we're getting really, really ace at that. <laughs> we're really good at that. 
But to do good, we, we have no idea what that is. We, we don't know how to do that. And then look at verse 23. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. What? Go on. It, and the heavens, they had no light. Oh, well, wait a minute. Isn't that almost word for word what we read at the beginning of the Genesis story, that the earth was without form and void, and the heavens had no light? But what was the verse just before this about? It was about people who are foolish and have no understanding, who are wise to do evil, but they don't know how to do good. Well, if the zero, you see what I mean? You've got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, these six steps, or seven steps, you know, from zero up to six steps of more and more life. And if step zero is about human beings who don't understand or doing evil, you know what I mean? You just think when you read that story originally that without form and void means that, oh, there was just dirt and there was no light and something. It was just a big, you know, there was, there was water. The Spirit of God was hovering on, the, but there was nothing there. It was just like a planet with nothing there. But if Jeremiah is telling us, no, what I'm talking about as the zero position is someone who has plenty of life, like the prodigal son. The prodigal son had plenty of life. He had thoughts. He had feelings, he had intentions, he was doing this, doing, oh, there's a famine, I've got to do this. You know, he was alive. But when he came back to his father, his father said he was dead and is alive again, suggesting that just thinking and feeling and having intentions and doing dumb things, blowing all your father's money and all that stuff, uh, it's not the highest level of life that it's possible for us to experience. If that's the zero position, I don't know if I'm getting this across, but if, that's the, if the zero position is that you're thinking and you're breathing and you're understanding and you're willing things and you're wise to do evil, but you don't know how to do good, and that's what it is to be without form and void, what are all these? Because this already looks pretty alive. I mean, if you saw that person, you say, well, are they alive or are they dead? Oh, they're alive. For sure they're alive. And yet what I think the creation story is actually saying, when you look at it through the Swedenborgian lens, there are many, 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 many layers of life. There are many kinds of life, human life, life of the mind and the heart above just being foolish people of no understanding. That's the zero position. One would be even better where there's light in your mind and you understand the difference between light and darkness. Even better than that would be you have truth and you understand, oh, there's higher truth and there's lower truth. Even better than that would be to start to do some repentance and you start to see these little bits of, of goodness growing up. It's something worthwhile, you know, that you're actually producing something valuable. Oh, even better than that would be to have love in your heart and to have faith in your mind, even better than that would be to have living truth in the inside of yourself and living truth in the outside of yourself. And some of them are even big, you know, they're big, they're big truths. They're, they're big, great, great whales, great fish in the ocean and so on. And finally, to get to the point where you have love, a living kind of love in your heart meant by the animals. And last thing of all is the only thing that the Lord calls human which is getting to the point where actually what you have in your heart is the Lord's love. What you have in your mind is the Lord's wisdom. You know, this is the angelic state to be truly, truly human. Many levels of life. And is that a raising? That's a raising. That, that's being raised. And so what is your definition of dead then? Doesn't it seem like in the creation story, dead is being wise to do evil but not having any knowledge of how to do good you know that's dead that's the before picture so yes one meaning of death is just physical death and it's a beautiful thing is it not you know when when you have those brushes with death or when you th think you see it coming or whatever isn't it a beautiful thought uh, that the lord has the power to resurrect us, to carry our spirit through that, all the testimony of near-death experiences and so on, 
that the Lord is able to raise us out of even that physical death, that last breath. He can pick us up and keep us going, hold all the pieces together. As someone said, he, he, can, he can go from matter to spirit without spilling a drop and uh, lift us up. That's a beautiful thought. But there are other things than physical death. In some ways, there are things that are worse than physical death. There's being dead in your spirit. There are several different types of death. One of them is that when we are all the way at the without form and void, when we're already at it, when we're at day zero, you know, uh, and we may feel like, oh, we've come a long way. We went through our childhood, our teenage year. Now here we are, an adult, and we're doing this and we're doing that. But actually, you know, the lights are on, but nobody's home. You know, nothing, not even the lights are on yet. Uh, there's, there's not much there, and we don't even realize we're dead. There's not even enough spiritual light to realize, oh, I'm without form and void. You actually feel like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really something. I'm, I'm doing fine here. That's a form of death, being on the outermost level, the outermost rind of what it is to be human, and no deeper than that, is something that the Lord refers to in the Word repeatedly as dead. Doesn't look dead to us, it looks, looks fine, full of life or whatever, but the Lord has a different, has a deeper definition of what dead is. Another thing that the Lord calls dead, which you also see on this chart here with the sun and the moon and everything, is having a lack of love. Having a lack of love is to be dead. And we go through a lot of our lives, you know, we can, we can certainly spend a lot of time in a state that feels dead, not having that love. And what the Lord wants to do when He raises us up is to raise us up into love so that we have that love. Another type of death is when we go through what the scripture refers to as temptation, which is a test, it's a trying experience and so on. And it is actually designed in a way to quote unquote, kill your outer self. You know, in other words, there's some aspect of your outer self, some behavior, some attitude, some falsity or something that needs to be taken out. And when we allow the Lord to take us through those temptations, and how many of those did Jesus go through? It was just continual temptations that he was going through and conquering. Uh, that is how we are reborn. That's how we are brought to life. And so there's a kind of death in there. And you can be physically fine, you know, uh, but you can feel like you are really going through something, you know, that you feel like a zombie or the walking dead or something. That, that's another kind of state that we go through when that outer self is being killed. And finally, uh, and there are probably other definitions, but, but Scripture uses the term dead to refer to damnation. And really, damnation is a state of being stuck at day zero. You know, it's like having made a, ch I shouldn't say stuck, I mean, having made a choice, an ardent choice to remain in that state of just being on the absolute outside of life, not wanting any of the transformation that the Lord offers us in those days of creation. No, I don't want truth. I don't want love. I don't want understanding. I don't want to have living things in my mind, my inner mind and my outer mind. I don't want to have good feelings going through my heart. I just want to stay right here where I am on the outside. And that, that uh, damnation is a, is a state of death. And the amazing thing is that these miracles say that even that state is something the Lord can bring you back from. If you're willing to to be raised. He can raise you from the dead. And who else but the Lord could bring you through that? Who else knows all those seven days of creation and how to develop that in us, how to bring us to more and more kinds of life, where at each stage you think, wow, I'm really alive now. I, I, have, little, I have little sprouts coming out of my earth and I, you know, the, actually there's, there's something to eat and, and, and it's amazing, the light and the, you know, it's so much better than it ever was before and you don't even know the sun and the moon are about to come, transform your whole life. Uh, many, many layers of life that the Lord wants to offer us. So I think this is an image of why these people get taken up to the upper room. Why, why do you go up to the upper room? You know, the Lord wants to lift us up out of the basement of ourselves 
in order to, to bring us to a higher life. He wants to get us up, up out of that old self and give us some new life. So, so many of these healing miracles happen upstairs. This is a picture. These healing miracles are pictures of what the Lord wants to do to all people. Lazarus represents all these people, all these people we've been hearing about on the radio, the, what they call the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, you know, people who have no religion or whatever. The Lord loves them and wants to say, come forth. You know, I want to, I want to give you all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, he's got beautiful things to offer. Uh, and that when we see this going on, like when you go through this transformation, if you allow the Lord to take you from day zero to day one, or from day one to day two, day two to day three, other people believe. Like watching you raised from the dead is something that helps other people believe. That's part of what's in these miracles is it again and again and again. Oh, now I believe it's the word of truth. And one final element about that, Jesus is the word made flesh. It's the word that brings these people to life. Well, what does Elijah mean, that Old Testament prophet? Oh, as it turns out, he means the word. He means the prophetic word of the Old Testament. What does Elisha mean? Oh, he means the word. You know, that's why Elijah is seen with Moses. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. They both mean scripture and they're both seen in the transfiguration because they mean the word. It's the word that keeps bringing these people to life. So what do you think Peter means? Well, he means the word. He brings them to life. What, what does Paul mean? He means the word because he brings them to life. The word is what brings us to life. And the Lord says to his disciples, I'm charging you to raise the dead. I'm charging you to do it. And whether it's the way the Lord did, you know, with a touch of a hand, or whether it's by calling out words, you know, saying, come forth you know, by the truth, the teaching of the truth, the word has the power. We may not see it. We may not be very far on this. Well, all we may uh, dimly, hardly even be aware of is the spirit of God hovering on the face of the water just getting ready to do miracle number one of very, very many miracles from there on out. But this is what the Lord wants to do for us. So when he came into this world, it was an important part of his ministry that he bring people to life because this is a picture of what he wants to do to us. And part of what I wanted to convey, and I hope I've gotten across tonight, is the idea that there's more than one kind of dead and there's more than one kind of alive. And if you let the Lord bring you to life, he will do this again and again and again, you know, layers and layers and layers and layers of it. Think of him coming down, risking his life to come to Judea to, to save Lazarus's life. It's such a picture of his love for, every, for the whole human race that he wants to come into the world and he's gonna risk death and all these plots against him, plots against Lazarus and all this, uh, because he loves everybody so much. He just wants to come into the world to be able to rescue us. And one of the great joys, one of the great joys that angels have in the Lord's name is to be there to resuscitate people after they physically die. It's just such an intense pleasure for them. They just love it participating in that act of bringing to life, showing you all the exciting, beautiful things in the spiritual world. They absolutely love participating in that resurrection that goes on after the physical body dies. And imagine, imagine it's un unquantifiable and inexpressible, the joy that the Lord has in bringing us to life. Doesn't it say that heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents Anybody who goes anywhere, if you just go from day zero to day one, heaven rejoices. The Lord has so much joy, his greatest joy, and why he came into the world was to bring us to life, and not just sort of one day of life, but all seven stages. He wants to take us to that limitless expanse of consciousness, uh, however alive we may feel. Uh, Swedenborg says, after you die, 
you realize you kind of in your life in this world, it's kind of like sleepwalking. We hardly knew what we were doing. You know, you come into a higher level of consciousness than you ever experienced before in your life. Uh, the Lord has so much more life to give us if we'll just be willing to lay aside, do our little part, lay aside that darkness, the without form, the voidness, you know, lay aside that evil, being wise to do evil, but not knowing anything about good and allow the Lord to do that miracle where we are, we're so dead and he's got so much life that he wants to give us. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful idea? Thank you, good friends. Shall we close with a prayer? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, no wonder you refer to yourself as the resurrection and the life. It's a huge understatement. You have so much to give us so much consciousness, so many layers. You know the dark parts of our lives and when we feel despair, when we fall into temptation or when we just feel absolutely dead and like there's no hope of resurrection. You come along, Lord, and with a word, with a touch, you bring us to life, get us up on our feet again. We thank you, Lord. Please help us. Show us how it is that we are to participate in others being brought back to life. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's keep on repenting, friends, so the Lord can do that full miracle. Amen.